Ever notice how some years you're practically drowning in olive oil? Yeah. And then other years you're like scraping the bottom of the jar. Right. It's like, where did they all go? Yeah. Well, get this. It's not just random chance. Okay. Olive trees, they've got this thing called alternate bearing. Uh -huh. And basically one year they're showering us with olives and the next they're practically on vacation. Yeah. So we're going to deep dive into why that is yeah. using this stack of research you've given us. Right. We've got like in-depth articles on like the actual olive tree physiology right. to even like a, a peek at some biophysical models, which is pretty cool. Yeah, very cool. And, you know, understanding this alternate bearing, it's not just like a fun fact for olive oil lovers. Right. This on-off cycle, it has massive ripple effects. I mean, we're talking global olive oil production, right. prices you see at the grocery store. Right. And of course, you know, most importantly for some people, the livelihoods of olive farmers all over the world. Absolutely, yeah. So let's unpack this. Like, what is actually going on inside these trees? Are they just indecisive about how many olives they want to make? Well, think of it like this. An olive tree, it's working with a limited energy budget, right? Okay. So it's got to choose where to invest that energy. Does it go into growing new leaves, branches, that kind of thing? Yeah. Or does it go into creating all those flowers that turn into those precious olives? Right. And during a bumper crop year, all those olives, it's like having a house full of teenagers. Oh, no. They are energy hungry. They are demanding all the resources, sugars, nutrients, you name it. They are sucking it all up. So it's like the tree puts all of its effort into that one massive olive family reunion. And then it's like, OK, I need a year to recover. I'm tapping out. Exactly. And that's where things get super interesting because this resource strain, it actually impacts the formation of flower buds for the next year. Oh, wow. So it really is like the tree saying, hold on, kids, got to recharge before we even think about another round of olive making. So how does the tree like actually regulate this? Is it sending like internal memos? Well, you know, it's more like this complex hormonal dance is happening inside. Okay. Remember we talked about gibberellins a, a while back? Yeah, vaguely. Yeah, those are like the plant world's growth hormones. They encourage leafy growth during that off year. Okay. Time to grow, everybody. I was going to say, so uh, I'm guessing then there's like another hormone involved when the tree's like, all right, we're back in business. Let's make yeah. some olives. You got it. There's this other hormone, abscisic acid, or ABA for short, and that comes into play. Okay. Think of it as like the counterbalance to the gibberellins. You know, ABA is often associated with stress responses in plants. Right. But it also has this key role in encouraging flower bud development. So it's like it's telling the tree, all right, time to get back to business. So we've got these hormones acting like, like you said, internal messengers. Exactly. Guiding the tree through this whole cycle. Yeah of growth and reproduction, uh -huh. that's pretty amazing. Like, it's incredible how plants, they have these systems. It really is. And it just goes to show that even subtle changes can have these huge impacts on the tree. You know, one of the studies you shared, it focused on stressed olive trees. Yeah, I remember that one. And it found that they produced way fewer flowers and fruit. Yeah. It really drives home how interconnected everything is within the tree, you know? Yeah, for sure. And we can't forget about, like, the environment that the tree's actually growing in, that's gotta play a huge role too, right? Oh, absolutely. While those internal processes are key, it's often the external environment that has the final say on if it's an on or off year. Think of it like the tree sets the stage, but the environment, it's calling the shots. Okay, so let's get into those environmental factors. Like, what are the big ones that make a difference for olive trees? Well, let's start with temperature. Now you might think olive trees, Mediterranean, they just love soaking up the sun, right? Yeah, that's what I would think. And while they do love those warm temperatures, it's actually the cooler temperatures, especially during the winter, that are crucial for those flower buds to form. Wait, really? Yeah. You're telling me those chilly nights are doing more than just making me want, like, a cozy fire? That's right. They're crucial for my olive oil supply. That is correct. A lot of olive varieties, they need what's called chilling hours. It's basically exposure to those cooler temperatures to, you know, properly wake up from their winter slumber. It's like their alarm clock. Exactly. And it gets them prepped for flowering in the spring. So those winter chills are like a wake up call. Precisely. And it's not even just about like the total hours of cold. It's the timing and consistency of those cooler temperatures. Yeah. That is key too. Because yeah. if you get Sudden temperature swings, you know, or 
unexpected warm spells during those early stages of flowering, it can totally disrupt pollination. Oh no. And then you end up with fewer olives in the fall. So it's like this it's like this delicate dance with the weather. And if one thing's off, yeah. It throws off the whole rhythm. Precisely. And we're not done with the environment yet. Okay. In addition to temperature, water stress, that's a major player, especially in those, you know, drier climates where olive trees are often grown. Right, that makes sense. I mean, they are known for being pretty tough. They are. Like drought tolerant. But even they have their limits. Right. Absolutely. While they can handle some dry spells, if they're dealing with prolonged or like severe water stress, it really disrupts that balance between growing new branches and producing the olives. Right. Remember that energy budget we were talking about? Yeah. When water's scarce, the tree, it prioritizes survival. Of course. It so is. it's like it goes into conservation mode. Okay. It might even drop flowers or, you know, young fruit just to conserve those precious resources. So it's like a chain reaction almost. Yeah. The tree's stressed. It cuts back on olive production, yeah. which then kind of sets the stage for, you know, a larger harvest the following year, maybe. Exactly. It all ties back into that alternate bearing cycle. Wow. So we've got the hormones. We've got the external weather patterns. Right. We've got, got like the tree's own survival instincts. It's a lot going on. A lot going on. To bring us a bottle of olive oil. Exactly. A lot of work goes into that. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of, you know, the work that goes into it. We've got a whole stack of research here on how olive growers actually work with these rhythms to try to make things a little less unpredictable. Right. But I think we should save that fascinating conversation for after a quick break. Yes. Let's take a break. Come back. We'll talk about that. All right. So we're back. <laughs> and you know those olive growers we were talking about? Yeah. Dealing with this whole unpredictable cycle. Right. It turns out they're not just like sitting back. Hoping for the best. They've got a whole arsenal of techniques to try and, like, work with these finicky trees. They've had centuries to figure it out. Right, They've yeah. gotten pretty good at managing it. Okay. Minimizing those extremes of the alternate bearing. Which is great to hear, because I was starting to think it was, like, all up to fate and, like, the whims of the weather gods or something. Right. So what are some of these strategies? Well, one of the, like, most fundamental ones is pruning. Okay. And I'm not talking about just a quick trim here. This is strategic pruning okay. to maintain a balance between the tree, like bulking up, right. so like all those leaves and branches, yeah. versus focusing its energy on fruit production. Right, because like we learned before the break, it's all about that energy budget. Exactly. So making sure there's enough to go around for everybody. You got it. Yeah. So by removing some of that fruiting wood during a heavy on year, growers basically prevent the tree from going overboard. Okay. It's like saying, hey, let's pace ourselves a little bit, you know, save some energy for next year's olive party. So are we talking about like lopping off whole branches here? How does this actually work? It's definitely more nuanced than that. Oh. Growers use like a combination of techniques, like removing excess branches, trimming back longer shoots, yeah. and even thinning out clusters of flower buds. Mm -hmm. It's all about, you know, fine tuning for the specific tree and the climate that it's growing in. This reminds me of something I read in one of those studies you shared. Yeah. Apparently, light exposure throughout the canopy is also a factor. Oh, absolutely. Even if it's not, like, as direct as temperature or water stress. You were right. Light often gets overlooked, but it is essential for photosynthesis. Right. That's how the tree makes its energy. Yeah, of course. And those flower buds, they need enough light to develop properly and then eventually produce a strong bloom. So... Cloning, it's not just about managing, you know, how many olives are produced, but it's about optimizing the tree's energy production. Okay, so it's like a long-term strategy. In the long run, exactly. The pruning's a win-win. Right. Helps manage the alternate bearing. Yep. Improves light exposure and keeps the trees looking good. Exactly. Keeps them nice and tidy. Now, you also mentioned thinning, which sounds a bit more hands-on. It can be, yeah. Yeah. It's another good tool in the olive grower's toolkit. Right. Thinning involves actually removing some of the developing fruit while it's still small. Okay. That does seem a little counterintuitive. I know, right? I'm like, why would you get rid of perfectly good olives? It's basically the same principle as pruning, though. Okay. Reducing the overall load on the tree so it doesn't completely deplete itself. All right. So it's not giving everything it's got to this one harvest. Exactly. And I bet timing is key with this too. Absolutely, timing is everything. Because if you do it too early, Wrong. then you're sacrificing perfectly good olives. Right. Too late, and it's like, well, the tree's already put all that energy into those fruit. You got it. 
One study actually looked at manually thinning olives within the six weeks of full bloom. Oh, wow. And they saw a much better flowering density and yield the following year. Oh, wow. So it does work. It highlights how much influence careful timing can have. So olive growers have to be incredibly in tune with their trees. They do. Constantly monitoring, adjusting. It's like a years-long conversation. It really is. Back and forth. Wow, it speaks to the depth of knowledge these growers develop. It really does. It's like this blend of traditional practices plus the science. Yeah. And then just, like, intuition. That gut feeling. Yeah. But there's one more technique we should touch on. Girdling. And this one is definitely not for the faint of heart. This is the more uh, intense one. Yes. That was in our notes. Girdling sounds intense. Fill us in. So girdling involves removing a thin strip of bark all the way around the circumference of a branch, or even the main trunk of the tree. I'm no botanist or anything, but that doesn't sound good for the tree circulation. It's definitely interrupting something. Yeah. What's the reasoning there? So basically, it disrupts the flow of sugars within the tree okay. and forces them to accumulate above that cut. Oh, interesting. So this can be an effective way to like encourage more flowering and fruit set during an off year. But, but there's always a but with these more intensive techniques, right? Right. It's a gamble. You have to be careful. Right. If it's not done correctly, it can weaken the tree. Oh, no. Make it vulnerable, you know, to pests or diseases. Right. So you got to know what you're doing. Exactly. It requires a lot of expertise. Yeah. Now, in addition to these, you know, hands-on techniques, there are also those less invasive things growers can do. Okay. Like what? Give us the gentler approach. Well, things like fertilization and irrigation, those are crucial. Okay. Just like us, olive trees, they need the right balance of nutrients, enough water to thrive. Makes sense. Especially during those critical periods, you know, flower bud development, yeah. fruit growth. By making sure that those basic needs are met, growers can help smooth out those extremes of the alternate bearing cycle. It's about like creating those optimal conditions for success, not just forcing the tree to do what we want it to do. Working with its natural rhythms. But speaking of respecting natural rhythms, that there's one more factor we haven't talked about, one that's increasingly hard to predict. Ooh, okay. This is where it gets really interesting. And by interesting, I mean, you know, potentially worrisome. Yeah. We'll be right back to dive into that after a quick break. Hmm. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> okay, you've got me on the edge of my seat here. What is this big, unpredictable factor that's like throwing a wrench into everything? I feel like I know where this is going. Yeah, you're probably right. It's the climate change elephant in the room, or I guess in the grove in this case. And it's something that researchers and olive growers are having to think about more and more because it really adds a whole new layer of complexity to this whole thing. Yeah, because it's not just about things getting a bit warmer overall, right? We're talking more extreme weather, unpredictable rainfall, all those things that can really mess with those natural rhythms. Exactly. Those erratic fluctuations, they directly impact those critical environmental cues that we were just talking about, the ones that olive trees rely on. Remember how we said they're so sensitive to temperature? particularly during that winter chilling period, and then again in spring when they're flowering. Right, it's like those periods are make or break moments for a good olive crop. Exactly. And now imagine those winters being warmer, so there are fewer of those essential chilling hours yeah. that can disrupt the tree's dormancy, and that can lead to delayed or like erratic flowering in the spring. Oh, wow, so everything gets thrown off. It does, and yeah. then on top of that, if those warmer temperatures are like extending into the flowering period itself, it can impact pollination too. Because if it's too hot, if it's too wet, the pollinators aren't gonna be out doing their thing. Exactly. Increased wind can damage those delicate flowers. Heavy rain can wash away pollen or make it impossible for the pollinators to even get to it. It's like this domino effect of potential yeah. disruptions. Yeah. And it all stems back to these increasingly unpredictable weather patterns. And then, of course, there's that issue of water stress, which we already know olive trees are sensitive to. As droughts become more frequent, more severe, how are the trees coping with that? It's a valid concern. Olive trees have adapted to handle some dry spells, but these really prolonged periods of drought, it's pushing them to their limits. They're having to make tough choices, like aborting flowers or fruit to conserve those precious resources. It's a clever survival strategy, but in the long run, it just makes that alternate bearing cycle even more extreme. Right, and that's what growers are trying to avoid. Exactly. So with climate change adding this whole other layer of unpredictability, what can these olive growers even do? 
do those strategies that we were talking about before, like the pruning, the thinning, do those still work? That is the million dollar question. And the answer is, unfortunately, it's complicated. Those traditional methods, they still have their place and they can definitely be helpful in managing alternate bearing to an extent. But as the climate throws more curveballs their way, Growers need to be even more adaptable, more responsive than ever before. So it's more about being flexible, being reactive, rather than just sticking to a rigid schedule. Exactly. They've really got to be in tune with their trees, adjusting their practices based on the specific conditions they're seeing each year. So they might need to prune differently one year, thin more strategically another year, or even rethink their whole irrigation strategy based on the rainfall patterns. It's all about working with this changing environment rather than trying to work against it. And what about looking even further ahead? Are there any like long-term things that might be able to help olive trees do well as the climate changes? Absolutely. One really promising area is developing olive varieties that are more resilient, you know, specifically ones that are more drought tolerant and can handle those extreme temperatures. So we're talking about like actually breeding olive trees that are equipped to handle these future challenges. Exactly. And that's an active area of research. And remember those biophysical models we talked about? Researchers are figuring out how to use those models to try and predict how climate change might impact those alternate bearing patterns in specific regions. Oh, wow. So they could use those to create like early warning systems. Exactly. Give growers a heads up about potential challenges they might see in their area. That would be a game changer. Right. Yeah. That kind of predictive power would be huge. That's amazing. It's good to know that there's so much research and innovation happening. It is. Olive trees, they've been around for centuries, adapting to all sorts of conditions. And with a little help from science and a lot of care from those dedicated growers, I'm optimistic that they'll be around for generations to come. That's a hopeful note to end on. So it's not just about enjoying that delicious olive oil. It's also about appreciating everything that goes into getting it to our tables and supporting those who are working hard to make sure we can keep enjoying it. Well, this has been fascinating. I've learned so much today. It's been a pleasure talking about it. It's amazing what you can learn from a deep dive into olive trees. It really is. And to our listeners, thanks for joining us on this journey. We'll be back next time with another deep dive. Until then, keep exploring and stay curious. Thank you.